In this material world, one of the laws of nature, of materialism, of everything of matter, is that everything is subject to the process of change, of aging, eroding, deteriorating, the elements breaking down, and ultimately perishing, dying. While it's true that physics has discovered that nothing really dies, matter turns into energy, and energy can turn into matter. So even if you take a piece of wood and put it into a fireplace, and it burns the wood, then the wood is gone, but it's been converted into energy, into warmth. Just as when you boil water, so the water turns into gas. If you cool the gas, it can turn back into water. You freeze it, turns into ice. So just different forms. But that same reality continues on. And yet, when it comes to our very defined lives, say a person is born on this and this day, and they died on this and this day. And everyone should be blessed with long, healthy years but nobody lives forever. Is that indeed true? Does the soul ever die? Because if the answer is that the soul does not die, and then point number two, that your primary identity is your soul, not your body, that would mean that you don't ever die. So then why do we talk about death? Because we see the material as so primary. That's not to take away from the importance of having a body, from the importance of having physical senses. When my father died 17 years ago, I still live with it. Still sad. Even though I totally believe that his soul continues on, but it's not in the body that I saw and knew. It's not someone I can hug, I can have a conversation with, at least not in a direct way where there's a back and forth. In other words... We do value the relationship we have in this dimension. But that's not the only dimension that exists. And that is why something I always say to myself and to anyone who's ever gone through any type of passing of a loved one. That is the time where you need to become as spiritual as you can because it's the only way you can communicate. And you can understand another way of looking at life is the spirit of things. We take for granted when people are healthy and well so we can communicate with each other, we can talk to each other, we can hold each other, we can see each other. But there are times in life that we're exposed and it reveals a deeper dimension of reality. So though I may have shared this many times, it's just, I believe, so poignant, it's worth sharing again. For years, I've been asked by people, naturally, upon the death of a loved one, of a friend, of a family member, where does the soul go? Is the soul of my loved, beloved one in a good place? Are they watching me? Can they see me? Can they feel what I'm doing? And it was always very frustrating because it was hard to put into words. How do you describe another reality, another state of consciousness that we don't easily identify with? Is it based on faith? Is it based on reason and rationale? It's not empirical in the direct sense of the word. But then, I don't know, something came to me, and I began thinking of it with this analogy, I began sharing it. As though it's almost, in a way, a ridiculous analogy, but it's also a very accurate one. You'll see what I mean in a moment. So think of an imaginary conversation, imaginary dialogue between a refrigerator and electricity. Here's how it goes. The refrigerator says to the electricity, where do you go to when they pull the plug? The electricity looks at the refrigerator and responds incredulously, what kind of chutzpah, what nerve do you have? You're a little box. They just invented you 100, 200 years ago. Learned how to generate me electricity, contain it in this box, to refrigerate or freeze food. And now you have the nerve to ask me where I go? I've been here long before you existed. In other words, your whole assumption and presumption 
is that you're the center of the universe, the box called the refrigerator, and where do I go? Maybe your assumption is wrong. Not only is it wrong, it's based on your own narrow myopic vision, which is from the perspective of your box. I go back to where I always was, before you were ever invented, to a place that's beyond your time and space, to a place that's not contained by any of the parameters you identify with. And that's exactly the example. So even though on one hand it sounds like a bizarre type of example, but everyone relates to it, everyone resonates. Because you say, of course, of course that's true. When we say, where does something go to? It's assuming I'm where it's at. I'm at the center of the universe. And where do you go to? So let's challenge that assumption. You are a product of what you experience. And what you experience is very limited. It's based on your senses, your sight, your sound, your taste, touch, and smell. Even if it's 20-20 vision and have perfect hearing and all your senses are working perfectly, it's still limited tools and instruments that can only contain and experience that which they relate to. Simple as that. So if someone asks you, where is love? You can't smell it, you can't taste it, you can't touch it, you can't see it, you can't hear it. Where our idea is the same. You need different tools. To use the classic example I often give from our author, Sir Arthur Eddington in explaining quantum mechanics where nobody ever saw an atom, let alone a subatomic particle, and yet we were coming up with all kinds of, the scientists were coming up with all kinds of bizarre and counterintuitive conclusions about indeterminism and probability and uncertainty states that were not defined, that were not determined, where you don't know the position and the velocity of an atom until you, until you observe it or measure it. And he gave the example of the fisherman that spread his net across all the wide seas and gathered all types of fish and started documenting the species, the sizes, the colors, etc. and came to a conclusion based on his observation. There are no fish in the sea that are shorter than half inch long. One small problem. There are fish in the sea that are smaller than a half inch long. As his little daughter pointed out, look at the goldfish in our fish tank. So what, So why did he come to this conclusion? Let's check your instrument. And when you look at the net, you see spaces of the ropes are only a half inch spaces. So obviously every fish that was smaller, smaller than that fell back into the sea. So we have to add one qualification. Using a net with half inch spaces, you will never catch fish that are shorter than half inch long. Very different than saying there are no fish that are half inch long, shorter than half inch long. It's saying with my instruments, from my perspective, what does the horizon look like? Someone in a valley will tell you, in a valley will tell you one answer. On, the, on a plateau will tell you a second answer. 20 feet on a mountain will tell you a third answer. And the person on the peak of Mount Everest will tell you a fourth answer. The story with Chelem, the farm of Chelem. Chelem was a little town. They say are very wise people, but their neighbors were resentful, so they created this whole folklore of the fools of Chelem. So there was the farmer of Chelem. Chelem was small. You can imagine a farm was a little farm, but it was his farm, his baby. He inherited from his parents every grain of soil he would take care of like a little baby. It was his farm. One day he gets a visitor from a big city farmer from Kansas, from Iowa, Texas. Shows him around, gives him a royal tour. They sit down to dinner. So what do you think about my farm? The Chalim farmer asked the big city farmer. The big city farmer had a farm of thousands of acres. Bigger, not just of, of, of his farm, bigger than his whole town, bigger probably than the whole country of Poland. Almost. So he says, well, your farm is nice and cute, but it's so tiny. The Helen farmer's taken aback. He's like insulted. So tiny? How big is your farm back in Iowa? He's looking for a point of reference. How is he going to explain to him a farm of that size? So he says, well, my farm... It takes me all day to travel from my tractor from one end of the farm to the next. Suddenly the Chelem farmer's composure changes. He looks at the big city farmer and says, with empathy and compassion, 
Don't feel bad. I once had a tractor like that too. <laughs> the Helen farmer couldn't even fathom something that size. So for sure, he understood it must be the, the instrument. It must be the vehicle. He once also had a shmata jalopy that took him all day to crank up to move from here to there. So he's telling him, I understand. Now this Chalim farmer was not malicious, he was not being deliberate, he was not being funny. He was being honest. If I were to pass out a note and ask you, are you objective, subjective, or narrow-minded, or closed-minded? Who would check over the box, I'm closed-minded, narrow-minded, I'm subjective? Most wouldn't. Because part of subjectivity is it makes you think you're objective. We're all subjective. So what's the difference between someone, how can you find the truth if you're all subjective, is saying... From my perspective, from my vantage point, for the, based on my experience, based on the net with half-inch spaces, there are no fish in the sea that are shorter than half-inch long. Based on the vantage point of being a chalum farmer, everyone has their farm. Based on my farm, it's hard for me to imagine a farm of thousands of acres, so it must be the vehicle. So remember, it's about our instruments. To recognize the soul within, of, within each one of us is to understand that there's a wider horizon that is not defined by our senses. So as valuable and as important and as stimulating and as dominating our senses are in our lives, they're not the final say. They're a piece of the puzzle. They will tell you that which they can perceive. Your vision will tell you what it sees. Your ears will tell you what it hears. Your nose will tell you what it smells. The same thing with taste, t- t- taste and touch. You want other instruments? You can use your mind instruments, your intellect, emotional instruments. But they also have their parameters. They may be wider parameters. But as you go deeper down the rabbit hole, you come to discover that those tools are also limited. Until you find that there's some tools that you can't directly experience, it's through extrapolation through process of elimination. The black hole. We all know that a black hole cannot be seen. And yet we know there are black holes. It's been proven. A black hole means something that is so powerful, the gravitational pull is so powerful, it doesn't even let light escape. That's why you don't see it. So how do we know it exists if it's black? Because we see its effect on the surroundings. If you had a piece of metal on your table and suddenly it started moving... It's not a magic trick. You wouldn't know how, but you would say there must be a magnet somewhere, maybe behind the wall. Maybe there's some other force that's exerting and attracting and drawing that piece of metal. So in these black holes, you see the effects of bodies that travel near it. You see them suddenly changing course. You see their orbits impacted. There are many ways to discover things that we can directly impact, uh, directly perceive. Give a psychological example. A good person who's astute psychologically and could pick up things that others will not pick up is not because they see your inner psyche, or they see your subconscious or your superconscious, is because they know how to extrapolate. And let me give an example. Imagine a uh, imaginary wall shrouded in darkness. You have no idea how this wall is shaped. You can't touch it. You can't shine a light on it. Is there any way for you to figure out what this wall looks like? The answer is yes. Take a rubber ball and bounce it on the wall. If it bounces back straight, you know that part of the wall must be straight. You keep bouncing, bouncing, bouncing. And if it bounces to the right, you know maybe there's an indentation there. It bounces to the left, there's another indentation to the right. You keep bouncing enough times like sonar. Sonar is like bouncing... shooting sound waves underwater, for instance, and seeing what bounces back. And then you can create an image, like a sonogram or a sonar image, based on the bounce, the, the, the return, the boomerang effect. So you may never see the wall, but you can actually picture the whole entire wall because you bounced enough times. Same thing psychologically. You're speaking to someone, and you see they're telling you, I have issues. You start exploring. What was your relationship like with your father? And they start sharing. What was it like with your mother? And then you start seeing, let's say, the person's avoiding. They don't want, I don't want to talk about my mother. 
or about certain aspects of my life. Why not? I'm not comfortable. Now, I never suggest coming in with an assault on someone's psyche, but that tells you something. It's like touching a nerve. I'm touching your finger. There's pain. If someone touches, touches here, there, there. So even though you don't see the cause of the pain, but by touching, you feel that sensitive spot, like a wound. And you can extrapolate and say, that must be a sensitive place. A person doesn't want you to go there. Same thing psychologically. So ultimately what's happening is you're able to come to understand a picture of somebody without seeing it by seeing what's being avoided. You're bouncing the ball and seeing how it bounces back. An area a person doesn't want to talk about is probably a sensitive area. And you have to tread carefully, but you know there's something there. And you can, you can discover deeper dimensions through this extrapolation. So it's a negative, it's called negating. In Hebrew, there's a word, yediyah sashlila. There's ways of knowing things directly. Interpolation and there's extrapolation. And that process can continue. You can extrapolate from an extrapolation. Going back to our topic at hand, it's another way of looking at life. The fact is we're trained, or maybe not trained, but the way we're trained is to look at things with our senses, which is important. That's our immediate tools. But our tool, che- our, tool, our tool chest is limited. Our farm is small. An intelligent person wants to expand their repertoire, expand your instruments and your tools so you can see more, you can experience more. That's called widening your experience, expanding your experiences. It comes sometimes with maturity. It comes sometimes with curiosity, a combination of all the above. That's called learning. And you're always learning your whole entire life. You never say, I have it figured out. The more you know, the more you realize how much more there is to know. And that too is part of knowledge. That should never be seen in a negative way. With that in mind, let's now go back to our beings. Who am I? I look in the mirror. I see a body. I see my face. Features on the face. I see my arms, my legs, the rest of my body. Is that all you are? We all know there's more, more to it than that. And since you know about yourself more to it, then you know others as well. Another person, you could say, okay, they're flesh and blood and that's it. We know there's a personality. The personality you can't see in the mirror. You can't hear it always in the sounds. You can learn, like I said, you can explore and discover deeper factors about our personality makeup. That meets the eye, but that takes either training or experience or perception. So who are you? How deep does it go? Let's say you can discover, okay, now I know also your personality, your emotions, your emotional makeup, kind person, sensitive person, a judicious person, a stingy person. I'm not getting now into good or bad, just the personality. A mind, a brilliant mind, an intuitive person, creative person. These are things that are not definable by the sensory, with our sensory tools, but they're definable. How far does it go? A soul means that you're going into the deepest part of who you are and actually cannot be defined by faculties. The faculties are faculties of the soul. In other words, in addition to the body, which is simply a vehicle, the body is the limbs, the organs, the body parts, that exists. But there's the spirit within it. So for example, you can have a heart A dead person also has a heart, but it's not beating. It's not feeling. A dead person also has a brain, but it's not thinking. It doesn't have the cognitive ability. So we know the soul, or whatever you want to call the energy within, brings you those faculties. But what's behind those faculties? Behind those faculties is the very energy of the soul. So the way the Kabbalists, and especially the Hasidic masters, explain, there's the soul itself. And then there's the soul's faculties. And then there's the body which are the containers, the channelers that express those faculties in a physical world. For example, you can have the power to write, but if your fingers aren't working, God forbid, for whatever reason, you're not going to be writing. So you need the faculty, which is a soulful faculty. You need the body, which is the vehicle, the instrument. And then the soul is behind those faculties is more of like an amorphous, say unshaped and seamless force that is the true identity of who you are. Indeed, the way the mystics explain it, there are five dimensions to that soul. Nefesh, ruach, neshama, chai, yechida. Nefesh is the biological soul. What does that mean? The life force. The mere fact that you are alive. 
Then there's emotional part of the soul, ruach. That your, your emotions are active. There's the intellectual part, as we've been discussing. And then there's the transcendent, and then there's the unity, the unify, called yechida, which is the essential you. It's not visible. Remember, intellectual and emotional are also not visible. Neither is the spiritual part of the energy within you. There are none of them are visible. But the unified is even beyond perception in the regular sense of it. The others you can perceive, people feel, I, I know I'm thinking. I know I'm feeling. Even transcendence is an experience. But then there's an experience that transcends transcendence. Here's not the place to go into all the details. The point I'm making here is that there are dimensions in you far more than the ones you know of. And those are not subject to the rules of nature. Because they're not physical. They don't have a beginning, therefore they don't have an end. Beginning and end, I mean in the material sense of the word. They have beginning in the sense that they come from somewhere. But like with electricity and the refrigerator, it's not bound by the parameters of the refrigerator. The box cannot contain electricity. It can channel it and keep it bottled, so to speak. But it's only bottled for that short period of time. And most importantly, it doesn't define electricity. Electricity is also there, but there's also electricity outside of the refrigerator. The same thing with the soul. The soul is in the body and in the faculties and enters into the physical parts of our body, my arms and legs and my mind and my heart and my, all my faculties and, and, and resources. But there's much more to the soul than it's occupying the body, like more to electricity than occupying the refrigerator or any other appliance. And when you get to know that part of yourself, you come to realize not only is it an additional, it's actually the real you. What defines reality more? That which we see with our eye or the subatomic particles that you never see? The DNA and the cells and the genetic matter? Or that which is the physical expression of it all? So reality actually is within. The more you can experience it on our terms in a way that defines and limits its true reality. It's not real in the realest sense of the word. When I say it's not real, I don't mean it's an illusion. I mean it's limited like the person in the valley or the person on the farm, seeing things only from the farm's perspective. So really, discovering your soul is discovering and expanding your horizons. It's spreading your wings. It's standing up on the mountain and seeing a, a view, an awesome panorama that you would never have seen on your own. And then you come to discover that that part is the eternal aspect of you. That never dies. That lives on through your good deeds, through your legacy, through the impact you've had on other people in their lives. And indeed, that is what's called real life, not the life that you live, that we see when you're walking this earth, but the impact you have on the next generation and on generations to come. That's where it really comes alive. So of course we want to have life as it is in this world, and we want it to be permanent. But the real permanence is on the soul level, and we're promised that we'll also be able to manifest it ultimately on the physical level when we refine the material world enough that it can be a seamless flow and a transparent channel to that eternal life of called the spirit. So infinity and eternity are indeed very real. The fact that we don't experience it is because we're living in a temporary and transient reality. And it's up to you to determine which is your life. And that will determine the eternity of your life. If you define yourself by the transient, by the temporary, by that which erodes and deteriorates, then you've written your own script. But if you define yourself by your soul and by the eternity of it, you live on. And you live on by recognizing it's not just my immediate instant gratification that de defines me, the immediate pleasures, but it's the things I do that even though immediately may not always be as comfortable, but for the future and for permanence, it's forever. So my friends, in the final scheme of things, we have an entire reservoir of resources and strengths that we often are not even aware of, let alone access. And that's the eternal part of who you are, your soul. And that sense, the soul never dies. That's why we can talk about people, our ancestors that lived thousands of years ago, thousands of years ago. Take Sarah, 
This week's chapter in the Torah, we read, the chapter is called The Life of Sarah. When you read the actual verse, it talks about her death, that she lived 127 years. But when do we really know that she's alive is after her death. Because the soul does not die. The body dies. And we see the soul's impact on her husband Abraham, on her son Isaac, on the next generation, the next generations. And when we talk about her virtue and her qualities, and we admire them, and we want to live up to them as a role model, 3,800 years later, that's called life. So yes, we want to have a combination of the matter and spirit. But let's never forget that there are things that never die. And you have the choice which side you will choose to channel. Will you be a vehicle for the, for the temporary, for the impermanent? Or will you be a vehicle for the eternal, for the values? And that's how you live your life. When you live a spiritual life, a meaningful life, a life filled with virtue and kindness and warmth and illumination and serving and helping others, you yourself become a channel for that eternity that will live on long after your body may not be here. Which deserves another discussion, and we'll reserve that for another time, is can we actually transform the material world to also be a channel for that eternity? And the answer is yes. But it begins by first connecting to that eternal and not worshiping the temporary over the permanent. Thank you so much. This is Simon Jacobson, MeaningfulLife.com, where this and many other programs can be found. A wide array. Check it out, MeaningfulLife.com. Love to hear your feedback, your comments, your thoughts. And please share. Please share. And may we build eternity in our lives, eternal values within ourselves, eternal relationships, eternal bonds. And it's an honor for me to be part of your life, and I hope it's an honor for you to be part of my life. And um, may we all, and that, that, that I be part of your life, I should say, and that we all together in this links in an eternal chain continue passing on the light, sharing, paying it forward. Thank you so much. Be blessed and be well. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com donate.